Hello and back again to the second part of the Bitwig Controller API tutorial. I was really surprised how many people want to dive into coding with Bitwig and how much positive feedback I got, especially on the Facebook group. So by the way, if you are not a member of the Bitwig Facebook group, go there and join us. There are lots of nice people there. Okay, so second part, I promised you that we will dive now into real coding and actually that's not fully true because we can generate code, which is even better because we don't have to write it. Bitwig has a feature to get you starting with writing your script or extension by generating a framework for you. To do this, you have two options. One is either to use the commander or the second one to look in that area, which we used also in the first part where the developer resources are linked and they you can create a new project, which in that context has the meaning of creating a new development project. So let's try that straight away. And I started Bitwig here. And what you need to do is either go here to help documentation and scroll down again. And there you can click on new project. Second way is, I will show you that too, is just to open the commander, which you can do by here on my keyboard, it's control and the return key. And there you can simply type create and there you see create new control surface project and you will end up in the same dialog as via the other way. In that dialog you have now two options either to create a project for Java or to create a project for JavaScript. I will show you both in the different parts of this tutorial but since JavaScript gets you started much easier we will start with JavaScript. So here you can fill in some information which will be inserted then into the script. So first First thing to do is to give it a name and I thought okay why not look into I have also Yamaha Mox F here sitting close to me why not do some simple support for that so let's say the name will be Mox F and the vendor is Yamaha and the author would be me so I type my full name in there and by the way meanwhile all that information since Bitwig 2.4 is now displayed in the controller section so this might be helpful information for the user of your script or yourself. And so it's a good idea to put some meaningful information in there. So this is a version number which you can increase. We will leave the MIDI input outputs for this first script at zero. And the location is important. I will tell you more about that in a second. And on my computer, I stored it in somewhere in programming Bitwig controller script. And let's say OK. Okay, and then this script gets created. We need to talk a little bit about folders now. So where Bitwig stores the extensions and controller scripts are in two directories. So all the controller scripts, which means nowadays the JavaScript implementations are stored in the controller scripts folder and the Java implementations are stored in the extensions folder. And you will find those two folders in the Bitwig Studio folder and on Windows, they are located under your user's documents folder. On Mac and Linux, Linux, it's one level up, so it's not in a documents folder, it's directly in your home directory under Bitwig Studio extensions and controller scripts. But for the controller scripts, there is an option in Bitwig that you can change that. So there you can set a different directory. But this, if you change this one, this is only the thing for the JavaScript. So let's go back to Bitwig because I changed that. So if you go to settings and there you see the locations, this is the same as it was in the slide. So you see here my controller script and here you can change the path but you don't have to do it. But normally it's a good idea to keep all your data and your documents and your stuff somewhere else than in this, as I call it, the crap folder, because every application puts stuff in there. So I just don't use the documents folder, just as a side note. So we created now our first script. So let's see if that works. So if we go also again back to controllers, you see here is a add button. And I think I need to move that a bit up so you can see the long list of controllers coming up there. There. And I think I still need it move more a bit. So let's do it like this. I click on add now. <laughs> you don't see it, but you see here is the Yamaha right at the end and it already turned up. And this means it's already there and working. So if you select it, you will see here it's already there and it's not yet running, but we can enable it. And now it is running and you will see there is now also the information that it's written by me, the version number we inserted there. How can we prove that it's really already doing something? 
something and working, there is the thing called the script console. How do you get there? This is really a bit hidden. And if you go here on the side, you see these two arrow dots. I don't know why they put it in there, but there it is. Here is a button called show control script console. And if you click that, you will get to the console. Since this is very, very hard to find and not nice to do, I did an easier way. I just assigned a keyboard command. So if you go to shortcuts and there you search for console. So you see here is a command show control script console. And what I did is to assign it to control shift plus J. And then you have a much faster way because you need it all the time for checking or for bugs or these things. So if I just press now the key command, I will be straight at the console. So the controller script console is not only for the scripts, but also for the extensions, by the way, and it will show you different information. On the left, you see all your running scripts. With the first one, it shows you some global information. For example, there were some MIDI inputs removed or added. And then you see all your running scripts. And you see also the last one, the mox F we created and started, is now also in that list. And it gives you also some output. It says called in it, and it says also it's initialized. So it's working nicely. And this controller script console has some features. For example, you can restart a script so it's start it again. You can just type restart and press return. And as you see, there is some kind of exit function called the init function and it's running again. There's also a shortcut for that. So you can press also control plus R and you can reload it very fast that way. Another thing is it works like a command console as well. It also remembers the commands you insert back there. So if you use the up arrow, you will get also to your last commands. It's still a little bit buggy. It's one back from version one, which is not really fixed at sometimes it's showing different commands than you expect, but normally it's working nicely. We created our first script. We started it. It's running. That's fine. So let's finally have a look at it and going back to the controller and we see down there again our script and what you can do is you can do a right click there and if you do a right click you see a little nice feature there that you can say reveal file and what happens then is that a dialog opens and shows you where that file is located and as you see it's not in the default folder here for me because I assigned a different folder and there is a created script and what Bitwig also did was create a folder for that. So that's a nice thing because if you plan to have multiple files, it's already a nice organization for that. Let's open it up. And this is also something we need to talk about. How do you edit your scripts? You should have a text editor, any text editor you like, but I would highly suggest to get an editor which gives you syntax highlighting for JavaScript and some error checks and auto automatically formatting of your code. This saves you a lot of work. I'm using here Microsoft Visual Code, which is not to be confused with the Visual Studio, which is a big full blown development environment. And a nice thing about this editor is it's available on all platforms. So you can also get this on Macintosh or for Linux and you have the same work environment on all platforms. And that's also a good idea. If you release a script to the public, it's really a nice thing to do to test this on all three platforms, which is a bit of a hassle, but nevertheless, you can be sure it's working fine on all three platforms. Okay, having our script here, we need to talk about some things we see in there. Let's start at the head and the first function, which is called load API and a seven. If you remember the first part of the series, I told you about the different API levels we have and which needs to be supported by your specific Bitwig version. We have here number seven, which means we're using the currently latest API available, which comes with Bitwig 2.4. If you want to support all the older versions, you can change that and lower that to, for example, let's say I only use features of version four. So this is totally up to you. I suggest always to go with the latest, but if you want to be nice and also support people with older versions, feel free to do that. The next function will tell you if that works or not, because this one will crash your script if you're using a function from an API, which is not supported. This is a function you need to call in all of your scripts, otherwise your script 
script or extension will simply not turn up. And what it does here is it shows all the things we entered there. So we say, okay, it's for a Yamaha device. The name of our script is MoxF and the version number is 0.1. And here is the name of the author. What is that weird thing here? This is something called a UUID, which means it's a unique universal identifier. Don't forget to modify that number. If you need a new UUID, you could simply tell Bitwig to create you a new framework, or you can go into the internet and search for UUID generator, and you will find plenty of UUID generators in the internet. And for example, if you go there, you will directly get a new UUID, and this can be simply copied into your script replacing that one. Okay, so this one assigns the script. We can, for example, say this is not version dot one, it's version dot two. And let's store that and let's go back to Bitwig and let's go here and you see it got automatically reloaded and it shows now version 0.2. And if we also open up the console, you see that it, okay, you don't see because there are a lot of them. Let's maybe, one trick is to do it like this so you see what is coming in new. Sadly there is no clear command to clear the console which would be a nice thing to have. You can if you right click cut copy and paste but clear is sadly not available as a command. And let's go back to the script and say okay let's make it 0.1 again and then you should now see okay Bitwig picked it up and automatically reloaded the new version. Okay, now let's talk about the life cycle. What does it mean? How does it work in that script? So you have seen, if we look at the source code again, there are three functions in there. There is one init function, a flush function and an exit function. And as we also already saw in the output of the, of the console, yeah, the init function is called on the startup and the exit function is called when it's exited. Flush is a bit more complicated when the script is initialized, when it started after the Bitwig starts or you assigned it newly or you modified it, the script will evaluate it for errors and then init gets called. Oh, by the way, we could also create an error in there. Let's try that too, make something completely weird here. Just add a, an error and see what happens there. Let's go back to Bitwig and you will see you will get a big crash here. And this is already a log output. So the console is very helpful in that regard. Remove the space, store it and see what happens. It also gets automatically reloaded and you have the fine working script again. Okay, so the init function is called and if you look in the code in the init function, it simply says is text mocks f initialized and that's what we saw. We can also add this to the other function. So let's say here flush called and here let's say in the exit exited. Let's see what's happening now in a script console. It got initialized, but also flush got called. So what is the thing about flush? So it started, it's running our script. And then the next thing that can happen is either you have communication with an external device, like via a MIDI message or an OC message or USB information is coming in, then something happens and you have registered a callback function for that. What a callback function is, I will tell you in the next part of this tutorial. And you can also have a callback function for the so-called observers, which then inform you when something in a document, meaning the project of Bitwig changes. For example, a user changed the volume or created a new track or these things. So you also get an update. And if either of these things happen, you will get a notification in Flush. So Flush can be used if you need, for example, update the external device. So change the LED color of a button on your device or things like that. And let's Let's just verify if that is the case. And if I change now something here, let's say I move the pitch and you see it will nothing will happen because I did not register a command. Also here, it will not be notified. Bitwig has this optimization. Only if you say I'm interested in a certain value, we will get this update. So flush in our script is currently only called when I do a reload at the first time. And you also see exited was called and we have that information there as well. This tutorial already got quite long 
long. So I think we leave it with that. And the next time we will really look into how we start coding, what are the main elements we need to know about to implement some functionality. And next time we definitely will write some funky code.